nu Christine Figener introduceren. Uh, Christine Figener is a marine conservation biologist and ocean advocate who is passionate about conserving marine turtles, fighting ocean plastic pollution, and empowering women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. She has been working with marine turtles and cetaceans in Central America for over a decade and been applying her research findings to the conservation of these charismatic sea turtles. She is using her study subject as ocean ambassadors to uh, achieve her goals and also to connect people to our oceans. And she's in particular interested in highlighting the threats to the oceans and especially these last days we are seeing this more and more. Um, she has a PhD from uh, Texas University's Marine Biology graduate program and she works with two conservation organizations, non-profit organizations, um, NAMAC in Costa Rican Alliance, Alliance for Sea Turtle Conservation and Science Coast. Okay, sorry, I may have missed that, mispronounced it, but Christine will correct me. Then um, her claim to fame, and uh, this is something I've been saying a lot, um, is uh, this film where the sea turtle um, is seen and there's a straw being extracted from its nose. And I'm sure Christine is going to say a little bit more about that. So I'm going to stop here and uh, um, then hand it over to Christine. It will take a minute for, to, do, to do this, so please uh, stay here for Christine Figener's presentation. Thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name is Christine Figener, as Monique has already introduced me as, and thank you so much for having me here today. I believe a little bit strange because I feel I'm talking to myself, but I'm hoping that somebody is listening, of course. Um, yeah, Monique already said that I am a marine conservation biologist that is mainly working with marine turtles in Central America. But unfortunately, over the years, pretty much ever since I started working with sea turtles, the sad byline of what I've been seeing in the field is ocean plastic pollution and the impact it has on our ocean wildlife. And so over the past five years, I've become very active in advocating against plastic pollution in general. And today I would just like to tell you a little bit about this massive and sometimes a little bit overwhelming pro problem that we're all facing as marine scientists. So when we talk about plastics, you know, it is not always entirely clear what exactly is plastic. You know, it's just kind of a, a term that is, well, you know, describing a lot of different um, materials. But when we use the word plastic, we usually mean the synthetic kind of polymers that are usually made from fossil fuels. And they are chemically generated by linking thousands of monomers together. For example, bisphenol A, which you might have heard as BPA or vinyl chloride, which I have to say already are both pretty harmful substances. And the different types of plastics are, for example, PE, polyethylene, which are used in a wide range of very inexpensive objects, such as, for example, the bags that you get at the supermarket, the really flim flimsy kinds. And we have polystyrene, also known as styrofoam, which hot drink cups are made from, food takeaway containers, the packing peanuts. And of course, we have polyester, which unfortunately a lot of our clothing nowadays is made from. And then we have PET, which you might have heard as well. It's the bottles that um, usually contain the carbonated drinks like Coke or, um, or, or yeah, or cola and, and the Fanta and all of those things, or even sparkling water in Europe. And of course, also the microwavable containers because they can be heated. And then we have other things like PP, um, polypropylene, which the bottle cups are made from, or plastic drinking straws, yogurt cups and such. And we also have PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which, you know, shoes 
are made from the soles, the pipes, furniture and such. So you can already see, I just gave examples of all the different objects that are made from plastic. You can see we are just surrounded by plastics in our everyday life. And why I always have to say plastic is a miracle product, right? As I'm a scientist and actually even the the opportunity to talk to you right now is thanks to plastic because I'm sitting on a laptop that is made from plastics and I talk to you, you know, so that is a lot of advances in technology and science wouldn't be possible without plastics. But what I'm trying to explain to people and I'm taking that a little bit already to the front is our use of plastics, that we're overusing plastics. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves if that is really necessary. So what is the magnitude of the issue? You know, we always talk about, oh yeah, we have a massive issue. So I'm sure all of you have heard about the gyres um, of plastic that are circulating pretty much in every major ocean. And if you just think about how much waste in general, plastic and non-plastic is generated, it's about 2.5 billion metric tons all around the world. And within those 2.5 billion metric tons, we have about 275 million metric tons that is plastic waste. So that is a huge amount of plastic waste. And if you think about how many people live close to the coast, and just take out that chunk, then we're talking about about 100 million metric tons of coastal plastic waste that is produced. Of course, luckily, not all of that is actually ending up in the ocean, but it is still a massive number. We're still looking at 8 million metric tons of plastic that goes into our oceans every single year. So that is what we know. And what we can also see is, of course, that it is closely related to the amount of plastic that is produced worldwide. And the plastic production, unfortunately, is not decreasing, but it is actually increasing. So just last year, worldwide, there were 359 million tons metric tons of plastic that were produced. And just to think about it, you know, plastic is such a durable material, which makes it, well, so useful for so many things. But it also means that 60% of all plastic that has ever been produced is still on our planet today. So we started producing plastic sometime in the 50s. And you have to think about that most of that plastic, especially if it wasn't recycled or incinerated, is still somewhere either in a landfill or is floating through our oceans. So to also immediately you know, burst the recycling bubble, only about 9% of plastic waste is actually getting recycled. So that is a tiny amount and it is very disturbing, especially because a lot of the big companies, the major polluters are continuously trying to advertise recycling as the solution to our plastic problem. And it is just not. So the other issue with plastic is that plastic in itself isn't biodegradable. So that means it's not going to just break down in its parts and becomes you know, carbon and, and other organic matter that wouldn't harm anything, but instead it is breaking down by wave action and by UV into smaller and smaller and smaller particles up until it becomes microplastic or nanoplastic over time. Microplastic are usually particles that are less than five millimeters in, in, in size and nanoplastic uh, actually in the microscopic um, size level. So that is where plastic is going if, you know, if it's disappearing. And if we look at the different objects, probably all objects that you have been using sometime during your life. So we have plastic bags that take about, you know, the flimsy kind of take about 20 years to kind of break down into different parts, coffee cups, about 30 years. But if you look, for example, at disposable diapers or even a, just a plastic water bottle, it's 450 years to 500 years. And what all of those objects have in common is that these are all objects that we are only using maybe for a few seconds, a few minutes, and then we throw them out. And it is in no way in relation to how long they will still continue to exist after we've been using them. So usually we talk about those objects as single-use plastics, 
And this is exactly the kind and type of plastic that I'm so avidly advocating against because it is a sign of our lifestyle and of our culture, pretty much a culture of consumption and conveniences that, you know, is trying to propagate us to use more uh, because things are also breaking quicker if they're not made from, you know, more durable materials than plastic. Um, it is also trying to, you know, be as convenient as possible because it might be inconvenient to wash up a pair of cutlery of silverware and instead you can use a throwaway pair of cutlery. And this is something that is absolutely not necessary. I mean, we don't even really, in most cases, need plastic straws, for example, we could drink out of the cup. So we really have to ask ourselves, how much are we subscribing to this culture, this, well, this disposable culture, and also this culture of convenience? Yeah, so that's my microplastics that I've been talking about. Microplastics come from large objects, but a lot of times it also comes from, for example, from our personal care products. Um, or, and that's even worse, I just mentioned already, a lot of our clothing nowadays is made from plastics like polyester. And there is no filtration system in place, at this point at least, that is able to treat our sewage water before it ends into our waterways or into our oceans that will filter out the fabric, the actual fibers that will be released while washing our clothing. And in the samples that we can find in the ocean right now, you can see about 35% of the microplastics are actually from clothing, synthetic textiles. So that is another area where we have to be thinking about like, you know, okay, what else can we do besides the single use plastics, but what else in our life is made from plastic that might impact the entire issue. And personal care products is like I said, the other part, um, it might not be as big of a uh, percentage at this point. And in a lot of countries have actually started to ban um, care products that contain microbeads or microplastics. But you know, if you think about toothpaste, if you think about any kind of facial scrub, all of those have tiny little plastic beads in them. And of course, you know, once you're done, you wash your face, it will end up in the sewage water. And again, it's not possible to filter them out. So where is the majority of plastic coming from in general? When we think about, you know, I just talked about the eight metric tons per year. So it is not, as most people think, something that, you know, oh, it's those cargo ships that just dump all their litter and that is where all this plastic is coming from. But actually 80% of all plastic is from land-based sources. So it doesn't even matter of how landlocked your landfill might be. You always have to think about that every single river eventually will end up in the ocean. So. A big or good example was like the hurricanes that we had in the US, especially like you know, Harvey that affected the entire Gulf Coast and just the amount of trash that was washed into the ocean during those events. And it doesn't even need to be as dramatic. It just needs to be, you know, a little bit of rain, a little bit of floods or even animals that carry certain plastic from the landfills to the waterways and it will end up in the ocean. Um, unfortunately, we also have a lot of issues with the uh, big plants that are producing plastic because it seems that a lot of the locations where they're operating, there is not enough legislation in place that actually restricts of how they handle their pallets. So in order to make plastic, you usually start with little pallets or nurdles, as we call them as environmentalists. And while they are handling those nurdles, it happens that they also get washed and blown into the ocean. So there was recently a huge lawsuit in Texas because of Formosa plan, if you're interested in looking that up, that has been for decades losing pallets in massive quantity into a Bay Area right there. Yeah, and of course, 80% comes from land-based forces, but of course we have 20% that is also coming from ocean-based sources. The cargo ships do bad things, cruise ships are actually massive polluters as well. And um, another big issue are com commercial fishing vessels because it's not so much the kind of trash they're dumping, 
but commercial fishing vessels are actually dumping their broken nets into the ocean. So instead of taking them back onto shore, a lot of them just dispose of them in the ocean where they turn into ghost nets, which are absolutely detrimental to ocean wildlife. And of course, they're also made from plastic. So every year, the Ocean Conservancy is um, organizing a huge cleanup um, on, in September. And it has become more and more popular worldwide, actually. And I couldn't find the stats, at least not in one that I could like, print out nicely uh, for this presentation from last year. But uh, this is one, and you know, actually the statistics are the top 10 of items, identifiable items that have been found on the beach haven't actually changed much over the past, I would say, seven, eight years even. So number one, I think for many years in a row are cigarette butts actually. Uh, food wrapping is a massive problem. Straws and steers, forks and knife. Oh. I'm told I can't be seen anymore. Mm, can you still hear me? Because then I can just give the presentation at least without, I mean, I don't think it's that interesting to look at my face. Oh, okay, I'm back, great. So yeah, so these are the top 10 items that are found on the beach every year. And you will see most of them are actually, you know, in the category of single use plastics. So we have food wrappers, straws and steers, forks, knives, spoons, uh, all the, you know, replacement uh, silverware, uh, plastic beverage bottles, which means the PET bottles, especially the plastic bottle caps, grocery bags and other plastic bags, plastic lids, and so on. So you can see it is a massive problem. And like I said, it's the identifiable objects, right? Because I don't know if any one of you has participated in a beach cleanup. A lot of the plastic that we're finding on, on the beach are actually, you know, little charts of plastic, which it's really difficult to tell where they came from in the first place. And now my presentation stuff now. Okay, yeah, and I have to say, of course, you know, the plastic pollution isn't just a problem that doesn't have a name. There are actually major companies that are contributing to the problem. And every year, the uh, Break Free from Plastic Coalition is doing a little audit. And last year, um, this is the result of the audit from last year. So we have as one of the major main polluters is Coca-Cola. Um, then another one is Nestle, PepsiCo, Mondelez. I think uh, they produce, for example, Mika chocolate, if I'm not mistaken. Unilever, I'm sure you're familiar with. Myers Procter Gamble. It's all the massive food producing, cosmetic producing, and cleaning products producing companies that are having issues with the afterlife of their products. So, unfortunately, there is no laws in place that actually puts them into the responsibility of making sure that whatever is left over from their product is also probably properly disposed of. So, and that is one of the reasons that we actually have this massive problem because they will continue telling you, please just recycle, please just recycle, but it is not working because first of all, not every community can recycle all types of plastic and second of all, the market for recycled plastic is not as big as they try to make us believe. So yeah, coming to the impact of plastic pollution, um, I already mentioned ghost nets, one of the major objects that are floating in the ocean are actually ghost nets or fishing nets, leftover gear from commercial fishing, but also artisanal fisheries. 
and it can cause a lot of harm so entanglement of course is one if the animal gets lucky somebody finds it cuts it out uh, but of course it can lead to drowning and other horrible things um, that will happen to the animal if not you know wounds from actually having those fishing lines cut into their skin um, and even amputate whole flippers for example in the case of, of sea turtles especially um, plastic also has interestingly other effects so Monique mentioned already my curious uh, claim to fame is actually a video uh, that I filmed in 2015 so I was on a research trip in Costa Rica we were catching mating turtles in front of the Pacific coast and we had this one particular male on the boat that had something funny encrusted in its nose you can see that in, in the first photo and we didn't even know what it was in the beginning so my colleague Nathan Robinson he is really interested in ectobines and when I finished my sampling I just grabbed my camera because he was interested of kind of investigating that object a little bit closer and lo and behold you know he started pulling on it and what we thought was a encrusted barnacle turned out to be a plastic drinking straw so you can see all its glory in the third picture it was about 10 centimeters long um, and had been in the nose probably for a while and whoever knows something about sea turtles they have a very acute sense of smell and they use that smell to find their prey and moreover it was actually that sea turtles are also expelling the water that they swallow with their with their prey through their nostrils so they don't lose the prey while they're holding on to it and this is actually the way of how we think the straw ended up in that turtle's nose because there is a connection between the buccal cavity and the natal cavity and plastic especially plastic drinking straws are really light so he might have he might have caught something delicious and was trying to expel the water but had also consumed the straw and the straw was trying to make its way out with the water and then got stuck so luckily that dude survived so we just removed it disinfected it released it and I actually saw him again well actually I didn't see it my local assistant saw him again two, two years later when he was mating again with a female um, in front of a ne different nesting beach so that was really cool but yeah, so the plastic, you know, doesn't always lead to death, but in other cases it can. So another massive issue beside entanglement and having objects getting stuck in funny locations, um, we also have the massive problem of ingestion. So the eating of plastic particles. And this is just an overview of the different groups of animals that have been found um, to have ingested plastic. So per group, it is species and for example for sea turtles uh it doesn't seem so much because they didn't draw the um square very big i think they should have actually done it for the for the percentage because it's a hundred percent of all sea turtle species have already been documented to have ingested plastic um you can see a lot of the marine mammals also have ingested plastic seabirds for sure uh, it is a massive problem and this is actually a problem that usually doesn't end too well for the animal. So here you have this typical um, photo of the seabird. Um, and they, you can really go to different islands and see those decaying bodies of seabirds and see the plastic in there. It's, it's not a single case, this happens there all the time. And um, on the lower picture you can actually see a display that we made from the different stomach contents of sea turtles that we had opened up and each bag was it's just the plastic part of the stomach content that was found in one turtle and i don't know if you can see the bottle cap within the big bag so this gives you an idea of just the size relationship of all those bags it's a massive amounts that have been found there and that was in the pacific ocean um, but we have another display from the gulf of mexico for example it didn't look much better than either so um the issue of course is that first of all plastic can be ingested and it just passes um then the animal gets lucky it can also just stay but the animal is still able to feed but in a lot of cases what happens is that those plastics are actually 
providing an obstacle. So they're obstructing the digestive tract and no other food can pass anymore. Or even worse, if it's shards that are not digested, they can actually perforate certain parts of the digestive tract, which would also sometimes be um, you know, fatal in a lot of cases. And then the other massive issue is that plastic particles are little sponges for very harmful toxins. So because of how pl plastic particles are charged while they're floating through the ocean, they are actually attracting a lot of really bad substances such as flame retardants and other things that are floating in the ocean and just accumulate them on their surface. So if an animal eats those plastic particles, those chemicals will actually remain in the body and will stay there. And you know, the more it eats, the more it gets accumulated there. And if that animal is eaten by, for example, a predator, this is getting magnified through the food chain. So that means the top predator of our food chains, especially marine mammals and sharks, are just contaminated by all the chemicals that we have in the ocean in general. And plastic pollution seems to be playing a huge part in that as well. So that could also, you know, at least affect the health of an animal. Um, so I think in orcas, it has been documented that um, the, the calf mortality has actually risen um, because of, of um, toxins that are found or like that the mom is passing on through the mother's mouth, for example. Yeah, and another issue that isn't much talked about at this point is, um, especially in conservation biology, we talk a lot about invasive species as one of the major threats to our endemic populations. And plastic objects are floating islands for invasive species. So that way they can make, you know, across entire ocean basins and get elsewhere and start well, you know, living there and invading that area, that's the reason we call it invasive species, which is absolutely detrimental to our ecosystems. And then of course, lastly, um, we always talk about the ocean, but in the end, it is affecting us as humans as well, our health, because we are eating fish and seafood from, from the ocean, and we are also ingesting plastics. We know that already from seafood, we are ingesting the toxins as well. And interesting enough though, is the ocean is not the only source of how we are ingesting plastics or how plastic comes to be in our body. So we know already we're breathing in plastics, um, likely due to clothing that is releasing plastic fibers. Uh, we know that just recently a study came out, the ocean breeze carries microplastics um, we also have too many products, too many foods that are wrapped in plastic. So each time, for example, you warm something up in the microwave in a bowl that is made of plastic, you will eat plastic as well. Um, worse than that, our drinking water contains plastic and within the range of different drinking waters, if you talk tap water and bottled water, bottled water have by a magnitude more plastic particles in them than our usual tap water. But unfortunately, both of them have plastic in them. And we are only starting to understand what those chemicals that the plastics release, as well as the plastic itself, are actually doing to our health. Because we have some ideas, there's some studies that have started to be conducted. So we know, for example, that brain development is affected by different chemicals um, that actually IQs have dropped because of that. And more recently, though, um, in recent years in general, we have found that our gut flora, so the bacteria that lives in our intestine, or the bacteria that live in our intestines, are super important for our health in general. So an unhealthy gut has actually been linked to depression, uh, any kind of other mental disorders, to chronic disease such as Crohn and other, uh, even arthritis, um, cancers, of course. And if you don't think about, if we now also having this, you know, the problem with the plastic that is thrown into this whole mix, I think we're only scratching the surface of 
what plastic does to us humans as well. So if you don't care about the ocean, if you don't care about the animals, you should at least care about your own health and see that you are trying to reduce the use of plastics in your everyday life. Um, so my suggestion and my general message is that, you know, it's great that we're all trying to clean up our oceans. I mean, I'm out there myself every, almost well, during the nesting season, almost every day, we are trying to clean up parts of the beach. And once we you know one time through, we're going back and start cleaning again because it's kind of this never ending story. But this is not enough. Um, I mean, cleaning is important because we need to get the plastic out that is already in our oceans. Um, just recently, besides the huge mass of garbage patches that have been documented in our oceans. A new study came out that actually shows that on the sea floors, we have similar patches where microplastics or plastic particles accumulate. So we need to get that out because it's not just going to disappear by itself. We've learned that already. But the other thing that is super important is we need to turn the tap off. We need to turn the tap off on plastics because, I mean, you wouldn't start mopping off your floor from a, you know, a bathing tap that is running over, you would actually first turn off the tap of that water before you start mopping, right? And this is what we have to do with plastic. So we need to reduce the production of virgin plastics and we need to reduce our consumption. What a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, it's pretty much basic eco economics. Um, the supply is, totally depending on the demand. So if we as consumers demand plastic free products, you will see the supply will follow. It might not be an immediate thing, but I can tell you already from what is available now to what was available five years ago, it's a massive change. I mean, I'm almost able to buy most of my foods actually without having any plastic wrapping. So you can think about, you know, first of all, single use plastics are almost feel are pretty easy to get rid of. One of my biggest challenges is actually finding replacements or like any kind of foods that are not wrapped in plastic um, and cosmetics. So that that's the thing. So but reduction is really, you know, from the three R's that you have learned, recycle, reduce, reuse or reuse, recycle. I don't even remember what the original order was. I'm always saying reduce, reduce, reduce and then try to reuse and actually recycling. I don't even believe in that anymore. Um, yeah, so important is also, of course, that our waste management is going to change. So we need to think about what happens to the plastic once we don't use it anymore. Um, if we can recycle, maybe it should rather be incinerated. Um, or we need a completely different system of how everything works, right? So that is what we're doing right now is not working and we need to stop talking about recycling. We need to think about other ways of how we can improve our waste management, of how we can repurpose things before it actually even ends up in the waste stream. And then in the end, making sure it doesn't just end up in a landfill and from then the ocean um, and else or on our, on our table. And that is the part also where the big companies need to step in and resume responsibility for the end life of their products. And that leads me to the next suggestion. We need to re redesign our plastic products. So unfortunately, um, of course, a lot of the big companies have caught on to the general you know, zeitgeist right now. Um, they are trying to please their customers. But since they are looking for quick solutions, a lot of greenwashing is going on. So, and the problem is sometimes that people are not well enough informed to really pick up on it. Because, you know, we're talking about finding new kinds of plastics, for example, or new kinds of materials that could replace plastic. And a lot of the times what people kind of, you know, go towards is bioplastics. But bioplastics in itself doesn't even exist um, as a term because bioplastics can either mean it is made from sources that are not fossil fuels. So you could make it, for example, from sugar cane, from avocado seeds, and all this sounds very ecological and great. 
but the actual product that comes out a lot of times is just a regular plastic. It is just one of the PETs, the PPs, the PEs, and so on. Because chemically, you know, you don't need fossil fuels to make normal plastic. So they call it bioplastic because it's not made from fossil fuels, which is great. But the problem is the end life is not any different to that of fossil fuel based plastic. So that means if it ends up in the ocean, it will just take just as long, four or 500 years, 400 years, and might be just as harmful to the wildlife than the regular plastic made from fossil fuels. So the other part then is, you know, bioplastics sometimes also describe biodegradable plastics. But there is the problem. Um, a lot of times when we talk about biodegradable plastics, we talk about PLAs, um, polylactic acids, which, yes, they are in theory biodegradable or compostable, but they are only biodegradable in very, very, very specific conditions. So that means if I throw a PLL, a PLA object into the ocean, it will not biodegrade, but it needs very high temperatures and usual industrial composts to really break down as it is intended. And the issue with that is that in a lot of countries, there are no industrial composting facilities that would actually do that. So, you know, again, if you just kind of, you know, look for a quick fix, it's not going to work. So the other um, thing that we've been talking about, but it's a lot more difficult and more expensive to produce is PHAs. Um, it's actually a kind of plastic that is pre-digested by bacteria. And these are the kind of plastics that are fully biodegradable in the marine environment, that are biodegradable on your home compost, for example, that will just break away into its organic compo uh, components and will not harm anybody. But like I said, almost nobody's using it because it is too expensive at this point still to, pr uh, to produce. And it is so much easier just to kind of put a green sounding name to another plastic and keep on producing the same rubbish that they've been producing in the past. Yeah, so of course the question is always what can you do, right, with all the very negative um, information that I've given you right now. I still believe up until we can trust that the plastic that we're buying may be bioplastic or biodegradable plastic is really doing what it's promising. I really think we need to look to ourselves first and reduce our plastic footprint. We have a lot of power as the consumer to first of all change the supply, but second also to make changes in our own life that will reduce the way or the, the amount of plastic that we will produce throughout our lives by a lot. A lot of us are also not living by themselves in a vacuum. We have families, we have kids maybe that we're taking care of. So there's a lot of plastic that could be produced, but it's also a lot of plastic that can you know, be canceled out and we can prevent that plastic ending up in our environment. So the, like, you know, to just go through some of the ideas, I'm sure most of you do all of that already, but bring your own shopping bag. You don't need any of the plastic bags that they are going to offer you at the store. Um, definitely you don't need bottled water. So rather buy yourself a reusable water bottle, even with a filter, if you're living in, in areas where the water is not like, totally clean, but there are great ways of how you can filter those waters already. If you're an avid coffee drinker, you can still go out for your coffee, but please bring your own cup. In fact, actually, you know, a lot of the big um, coffee shops like Starbucks even, they are giving you even a little discount if you bring your own cup. Maybe not right now during COVID, but um, definitely like, you know, in, 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 in our normal life, it works. Um, you can pack your lunch in reusable containers and you can definitely say no to disposable straws and cutlery. Uh, same as, you know, actually right now we have a lot of issues with people being in self-isolation and order and take out food. And I've seen that a lot of the apps have started to add um, kind of an eco button so you can identify restaurants easier that are not using styrofoam or plastic containers. And a lot of the other restaurants even have the option to say, please do not give me um, cutlery or straws as such. Because I mean, we're sitting at home, right? 
have, we have our silverware right there. We don't really need that anyways. Um, you can use uh, or even make yourself a uh, compostable produce bag. So if you go and buy veggies and fruits, there are already, you know, a bunch of, of stores that are offering to buy them. But if you are kind of crafty, you can make your own at home really easy just with fabric and weigh and package your fruit and groceries right there. Um, I a lot of times save any kind of glass jars that I have from, for example, pasta sauce or else to just store things in and actually buy things in as well. So more and more we have those stores that are popping up um, that are plastic free or package free at all. So you bring your own containers and you can weigh whatever you're buying. So you can buy olive oil, you can buy um, oatmeal, you can buy even peanut butter and almond butter that are, you know, freshly ro roasted and you just kind of pour it into your glass and you, you know, you weigh your glass before and after and then you go to the register and you can check out with it. And, you know, it, it is a little bit of time that you might have to invest to investigate where you can get your plastic free food. Um, even in the normal supermarket, you all usually have a bunch of choices. So I've, I've been able to find brands of rice, for example, that come in paper. I've been able to find brands of oats that come in paper and curtain rather in, in, than, in, than in plastic. You know, a lot of things come in glass if you look for it. You can even buy milk in glass if you want to, or yogurt. You know, yogurt is also another great one. So there's so many ways of how you can go about your grocery shopping um, and even cosmetics. I have gotten really into making my own cosmetics if I wasn't able to find anything that was packaged in glass or paper. Uh, super easy of how, you know, if you just get a little bit into it, like how you can get any kind of cleaning um, products in, in uh, yeah, going. Sorry, I think I'm almost done, Monique, just trying to give, you know, ideas to, to people what they can do. Um, yeah, and with that, I thank you all for your attention. I hope I've given you some ideas of how you can also help to change the world a little bit. Because always remember, it's just one straw, say 8 billion people. And it's really not about being perfectly plastic free. It's really what we need is millions of people that do it imperfectly. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm sure I can answer them in the chat. If they're in English, of course, I my Dutch is not that good. Thank you.